الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين We begin with the praise of Allah and by asking Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace to our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to his family and his companions I think the position of the table is a little bit better today I feel like I can see you all today I think last week I was sitting right back and the pillars and the camera and I felt like I was by myself. By the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us to be able to come together for another evening of tafsir of the Quran. And we are in the middle of what we just started the tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha. And we said that Surah Al-Fatiha is the greatest surah in the Qur'an. What's the greatest ayah in the Qur'an? Who knows? Ayat Al-Kursi. The greatest surah in the Qur'an is Surah Al-Fatiha. And we said that it's like a summary of the whole Qur'an. It's like a summary of everything that the Quran contains almost like an introduction to the Quran. And we finished Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim as much as time allows. So, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to resume our class today with the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So the first thing we're going to look at here is the word Alhamd. And we all know this word, right? We say it's not a strange word for us. We say it a lot, right? Alhamdulillah. What does the Al mean here? In Alhamd. So Al has lots of meanings in Arabic. A lot of people, if you ask someone who speaks Arabic and you say to them, what does Al mean? They will say it means the, right? Al-Kitab, Al-Bayt, but not always. Here, the Al in Alhamd, it doesn't mean the. It's something that we call in Arabic, Istighraqul Jins, which means it covers everything in that category. That's what it means. Everything in the category of Hamd. It means everything that falls within Hamd. And sometimes that's why if you read the English translation of the Quran, where it says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, it says all praise. Someone says, where is the word all? The word all in Arabic is kullu or jami'u. Where is the word all? We say, ah, here, it's a little bit subtle. It's in the al. The al here means every kind of every kind of or every type of hamd now we know generally i think everybody here knows that hamd means praise but here we have two terms that are similar to each other and we might we need to explain the difference between them and that is alhamdu wa shukr so what is hamd and what is shukr? And what makes one of them or how do we how do we distinguish between the two? We translate hamd as praise and shukr as gratitude. So the scholars say about alhamdu wa shukr bainahuma umumun wa khusus. That means that one of them is more general in one aspect and one of them is more general in a, in a different way. So in one way, hamd is more general. And in one way, shukr 
is more general. How is hamd more general? And how is shukr more general? What way? So hamd is more general because you, you say hamd to Allah or for Allah in every situation. Alhamdulillahi ala kulli hal. Praise be to Allah in every situation. As for shukr, gratitude, when do you say shukr? When you're given something, right? You say shukr when you have been given something. You say hamd all the time. You say shukr when you've been given something. So shukr is in response to a ni'mah, a blessing from Allah. That Allah gave you a ni'mah from Allah, then you have shukr. Whereas alhamd is ala kulli hal. You praise Allah in every situation. But how is shukr more general? I think for this, if we look at the ayah in which Allah Azza wa Jal said, I'malu ala Dawood shukra. Act, O family of Dawood, in gratitude. So what do we see about shukr? Shukr is with the tongue and the limbs and the heart. Shukr is a full body experience. Your whole body Make shukr to Allah. Shows gratitude to Allah. So Allah gives you health. You use your health to please Allah. You pray, you fast, you go help people. You go and you know, you use your health physically to, to show thanks to Allah. So gratitude can be with any part of the body. Whereas hamd is with the tongue. Alhamdu. Praise is with the tongue. So in that way, hamd is more general in the sense that it's all the time. And shukr is more general in the sense that it can be done with any part of the body. But shukr is only done in response to a blessing. Whereas alhamd, you don't look at whether you've been given a blessing or not. It's not about whether you have a blessing or you don't. Alhamd is something that is a constant thing which belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillahi belongs to Allah. This lamb here, lillahi, it means to belong. It belongs to him. It's his right. He's the one who deserves it. It might be that others are praised, but true, the true praise is deserving for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the question comes here, why? Now, I, I think as Muslims, it's not as important, but especially if you are explaining to a non-Muslim and they asked you, why? Why is all praise due to Allah? Why? Allah Azza wa Jal answers this question. Because Allah is Rabbul Alameen, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, Maliki Yawmiddin. That is why Alhamdulillah. So, in other words, Alhamd belongs to Allah because of His names and his attributes and his actions. Because of his names and his attributes and his actions, praise is only for Allah Azza wa Because of his names and his attributes and his actions. And so this is explained in Surah Al-Fatiha and it's explained throughout the Quran. If you look at any time that Alhamdulillah comes in the Quran, you're going to find that it's preceded or followed by something that Allah is in His names or His attributes or His actions. Alhamdulillahilladhi <laughs> All praises to Allah who guided us to this. We praise Allah because of His names and His attributes and His actions. Among which are 
his name Allah and this name or description of him Rabbul Alameen and his name Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim and his name Al-Malik and the fact that he is Maliki Yawmiddin or Maliki Yawmiddin these are all reasons to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this also tells us that from the etiquettes of dua is that when you begin your dua because remember Surah Al-Fatiha is just one big dua when you begin your dua you begin it with Alhamdu wa sana you praise Allah you glorify him by mentioning his names and his attributes and his actions and then you lead it into your question this is more likely for your dua to be accepted than for you to just simply say ihdina sirat al mustaqim that you introduce your request with the praise of Allah through his names and his attributes and his actions so what are the names and attributes that are mentioned in this first part the first we have to do or we have to stop with is Allah alhamdu lillah alhamdu Lillah. Allah, this word, the great scholar of Arabic, Siboy, he said it is A'raful Ma'arif. It is the most clearly defined word in the Arabic language or in any language. And I'm going to explain to you what I mean by that when I say that to you now. If I were to use the word God, and I were to go to a Hindu here in Dubai and say to him, who is God? So he might mention to me the names of some different gods that he has and he might mention this one or that one or he might mention some of his idols or statues or he might mention the greatest of his, the idols that they worship or he might mention three of them or he might... Okay, so I go to a Christian and I say to the Christian, who is God? The Christian might say the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I go to the Muslim and I say, who is God? And he says, Allah, the one that there is no God worthy of worship except him. But everybody understood the word God in a different way. You might talk to a, one of these feminists and you might ask them, who is God? They might say, God is a woman. Everybody has, for God, it's not clearly defined what we're talking about. It could be right, it could be wrong. As a Muslim talking about God, what I'm going to say about God is going to be right, inshallah. But it's not clearly defined. It's not clear what I mean until you explain it. When I say Allah, does anyone get any confusion? Not even the Christian, not even the Hindu, not even the atheist or the Buddhist or the Sikh or the whatever newfangled ideas they have, none of them get confused. When I say Allah, everybody knows what I'm talking about. And that's what Sibui said when he said, A'raful Ma'arif. It is the most clearly understood word. And it is the only name of Allah which has never ever been taken by others. Even the Dajjal, when he comes, he will say, I am your Lord, and a Rabbuk. But he won't say, and Allah, I am Allah. Fir'aun, when it's narrated in the Quran, he said, Ana Rabbukum al -a'la. I am your Lord, the Most High. But the name Allah, everybody knows that Allah, that is the Lord of the heavens and the earth, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Everybody knows. The other thing which makes the name of Allah different is that all of the other names are referred to by that name. So I don't say Allah is a name of Ar-Rahman. What do I say? Ar-Rahman is a name of Allah. So Allah is like the the the, the base, the, the, the source, you know, like the name that everything goes back to. And all of the other names are names of Allah. 
As for the meaning of Allah, it is the it is Dhul Uluhiyyah. The one who is deserving of worship. Or the one who has the attributes of divinity. Dhul Uluhiyyah. That is the meaning of, because the word Allah, linguistically, comes from Al-Ilah. And so this word, Allah, it means Dhul Uluhiyyah, the one who possesses the attributes of divinity. In that sense, all of the names of Allah come under Allah. Yani Allah is like a, an umbrella name that covers all of the other names. So if you look at it, Ar-Rahman is an attribute of divinity. So it comes under Allah, an attribute of being God. Ar-Rahim, Rahma, like this, is a name that indicates that the person who has this name is God, is divine. So all of these names come back to Allah. And that is why many of the scholars said that Allah is Allah's greatest name. Others among the scholars said the greatest name of Allah is Al-Hayyul Qayyum and others said it's not one name but a category of names. But I personally believe the stronger opinion if you gather together all of that hadith is that the greatest name of Allah is Allah. Because all of the other names of Allah go back to it. So Allah Azza wa Jal is Dhul Uluhiyyah. The one who possesses the names and attributes of God, of divinity. And Allah Azza wa Jal is Ar-Rabb. Ar-Rabb. So if Allah means Dhul Uluhiyya, the, the possessor of the attributes of divinity, the one who has the names and attributes of God, then Ar-Rabb means the Rububiyya, the one who has the attributes of lordship, the one who has the attributes of lordship, the one who is the Lord. And in Arabic, the word Lord is used, or Rabb, is used for Al-Sayyid, Al-Malik, Al-Muta'ah. And if you want more information, by the way, on these names, you can come to my Names of Allah series on, on YouTube and you can, inshallah ta'ala, uh, get even more details about each name. But just briefly, Ar-Rabb, the Arabs used the word Rabb for the master, the sovereign, and the one who is obeyed. That's in the language, in, linguistically. They, they would say Ar the, the Rabb is the one who is Sayyid al-Malik al-Muta'ah. The one who is the master, the one who is the sovereign, the king of everything, and the one who is to be obeyed. But the word Rabb in that sense could be applied to lots of things, right? If you don't make it like absolute, you could say Rabbul Usra, the lord of the family. So in his family, he's the head of the family, he's the master. In his family, he is the king, the owner. You know, he's the one and he's got all the he's the one who's got all the money. He's the one who owns the house. In his family, he's the one everyone listens to. So here we want to make it clear that Allah Azza wa is nothing like his creation. So one of the things this indicates this to us is that Allah is Rabbul Alameen. So who is Allah the Rabb of? Allah is the Rabb of a house, or is Allah the Rabb of a family, or is Allah the Rabb of a country, or a place on the earth? La, Allah is the Rabb of the Alameen. And the Alameen is the plural of Alam, and the Alam is a world. So Allah is not the Lord of the world. He's the Lord of the worlds, with an S on the end. So what are the worlds? Well, actually, if you think about it, there are many worlds. There is the world of men. Alam al-ins. 
There's the world of the jinn, alamul jinn. There's the world of the angels, alamul malaika. There's the world of the animal kingdom, alam al dawab. And how many other worlds that only Allah Azza wa Jal knows? Allah Azza wa Jal is the Rabb of all of them. And the word Rabb covers, like we said, the word Allah covers all of Allah's names. The word Rabb covers a portion. If we give examples, it will become clear. So if we say that from the meanings of Ar-Rabb is Al-Khaliq, the Creator. And from the meanings of Ar-Rabb is the one who gives to his servants or bestows to his servants al-wahhab and from the meanings of al-rabb is al-qadir the one who is able to do everything and controls everything these are all so it's all related to how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is it could be how he is to us or how he is in himself but it's all related to how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all of allah's lordship the, the attributes and characteristics of lordship so it relates to how allah is with himself and his actions as for when we talk about worshiping allah that's how we behave towards allah that's how we behave towards allah and that's coming later on in the surah so allah told us that he is rabbul alameen and if we look at alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen we see that this ayah gathers together the three types of Tawheed. Tawheed al-Rububiyyah and Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah and Tawheed al-Asma'u sifat in one ayah. As for Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah, it's found in Alhamdulillah. Because Alhamd is something that we do to Allah. Alhamdulillah. This relates to us worshipping Allah and that's one part of a Muslim's Tawheed. Your, the, how you believe in the oneness of Allah, one part of that is that you worship Allah alone. You, you in your dua, in your worship is only for Allah. And that's found in Alhamdulillah. As for Rububiyyah, which is what Allah does for you, then this is found in Rabbul Alameen. And as for the Asma wa Sifat, then there are two names found in this ayah, and that is Ar-Rabb and Allah. Both of them are found. And some of the scholars added Rabbul Alameen as a name of Allah. This is a, a difference of opinion among the scholars as to whether the names that are like sentences are names or not. So some of the scholars said Rabbul Alameen is in itself a name. And those are the names that are joined together like in a sentence form. Uh, like... Rabbul Alameen and Arhamul Rahimeen and Khairul Ghafireen. Some of the scholars considered these to be names of Allah as well. So it contains worshipping Allah alone, Alhamdulillahi, praises to Allah alone. And it contains that Allah is the Lord, the one who does everything for you, gives you everything, takes care of you, creates you, looks after you. And it contains Allah's names and attributes. Allah Rabbul Alameen. So this is like a title for the Quran. And anyone, how strange is it that somebody says you can't find three types of Tawheed in the Quran? Or they say that three types of Tawheed is something you guys invented, you know, 200 years ago or 300 years ago. We said to them, Ya Akhi, you didn't read the first ayah of Surah Al-Fatiha. Before we get to Surah Maryam, ayah 65, and you know, you didn't get to ayah number one out of Surah number one. And if you had read ayah number one out of Surah number one, you would understand that the oneness of Allah is oneness in worshipping Him and oneness in His Lordship and oneness in His names and attributes. And this is very clear from just the first sentence, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And there's no surprise that this is the first ayah in the Quran and the most, therefore the most important thing to gain your attention. That when you talk about believing that Allah is one, 
That means that Allah is one in your worship of him, in his names and attributes, and in his lordship and the things that he does for you, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. One of the meanings of Ar-Rabb is Al-Murabbi, the one who nurtures you. The one who nurtures you and takes care of you. And Al-Imam Al-Sa'di, rahimahullah ta'ala, in his tafsir, he mentions this, that this is what perhaps the secret as to why the prophets used to frequently make dua to Allah, Rabbana, Rabbana. You know, you get that book, 40, 40 Rabbanas in the Quran. Rabbana, Rabbana, Rabbana. Why did the prophets keep on saying Rabbana, Rabbana? The scholars, they say it is, or Imam Sa'di here, he suggests that it's because of this meaning of Al-Murabbi, the one who takes care and nurtures you and looks after you. And you know what nurturing is, like how you take a baby and you look after the baby, you feed the baby and the baby gets, you know, fed and clothed and looked after until it becomes a bit bigger and a bit bigger and then becomes an adult, that kind of nurturing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nurtures you. And Allah nurtures the alameen in one of two ways, a general way and a special way. So Allah nurtures the alameen in terms of generally, in terms of their, their life, you know, letting them grow in age, uh, giving them their sustenance, uh, teaching them what harms them and what benefits them in terms of, you know, what is suitable to eat and what is harmful to eat and how to live and how to earn a living. And Allah Azza wa Jal gives them a general nurturing. He, he, he causes them to grow or causes them to be able to live their life. But that's not the tarbiyah that we are concerned with here. That tarbiyah is a part of Allah's rububiyah. That the whole of creation is only here because Allah nurtured it. And if Allah didn't nurture you, you wouldn't be here. Not you, not the animals, not the jinn or the angels or the heavens or the earth or the stars or the grass. Nothing would be here unless Allah Azza wa Jal nurtured it and looked after it and took care of it. But that's in a general way. It doesn't distinguish between the believer, the disbeliever the inanimate object like a stone or a living being like a person. It doesn't make any difference between the animal and a person. Allah Azza wa Jal gives it to everybody. But there is a special kind of tarbiyah and that is the tarbiyah of iman. That Allah Azza wa Jal causes a seed of iman to grow in your heart until that seed of iman becomes like a tree of iman. It comes like a tree of Iman. Allah gave the example of a good word and the good word is La ilaha illallah. It's the seed of Iman, the start of Iman. A good word like a good tree. Its roots are firmly grounded, strong in the ground and its branches are up in the sky. That's the example of how Allah nurtures your iman. It starts off with a word, La ilaha illallah. And Allah makes it grow into loving praying and fasting and zakah and charity and being good to your parents and looking after the weak and the needy. And Allah Azza wa Jal brings about all of these branches and all of these leaves on this tree which came out from La ilaha illallah. When you think of that, that is the reason why the prophets called upon Allah, Rabbana. Because Allah gave them a nurturing that was even more special than what Allah has given to the other, other Muslims. And that is Allah looked after them in bringing them into prophethood and giving them the guidance and the scripture and revelation. So Allah took care of them and nurtured them. Look at the Prophet ﷺ. How did he grow? from the time when Jibreel grabbed a hold of him and squeezed him and said, Iqra. And he said, Ma ana biqari. Until the very end of his life, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How did he grow as a prophet in knowledge, in his 
you know, his connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in what he conveyed from Allah, it started with Iqra. And Allah Azza wa made it grow into this entire religion of Islam. It started with Iqra and it became 604 pages of the Mus'haf. Look at how Allah Azza wa nurtured the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. After you think about that, how could he not call upon Allah Rabbana, the one who nurtured me, my nurturer, my Lord. So that is something when you think about it, it instills a particular emotion in you. And that is the emotion of love. You feel immense love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you read Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And Alhamd, remember, is in every situation. So it's also reminding you that your love of Allah is constant. It's always, you know, doesn't matter what I'm given or not given. I love Allah for his names and his attributes and his actions, all the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is and does and is described with. And all the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given and the tarbiyah and the iman that Allah has given as a gift. When you think about the gift of iman and how Allah made it, think about your life. How many of you can say that you were practicing Islam from the very first day of your life? Some of you, alhamdulillah. But many of us can remember a time, I remember a time when I was not a Muslim. And then you think how Allah azza wa jal took me and I didn't do anything to deserve it. Allah Azza wa Jal took me from not being a Muslim at all to Islam. And then when I was a Muslim, I wasn't really under, didn't understand Islam properly and wasn't practicing. And then to start practicing Islam. And then Allah Azza wa Jal took me to start learning Islam. And then Allah Azza wa Jal blessed me to be able to sit in the masjid and share some of that learning with people. Wallahi, you, if that doesn't make you love Allah, what will make you love Allah? When you think what Allah Azza wa Jal has done for you, how many of you, for example, if you think about the beginning of your life, you're thinking about poverty, about hardship, about struggles, and alhamdulillah, now you're in a better position where you have, you're comfortable in your, in your dunya. Look at how Allah nurtured you. Did any of that come from your own hands? Well, I say, nothing. It came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah took you and looked after you and nurtured you and you disobeyed him. When, you, when he looked after you, you disobeyed him. When he gave you, you were ungrateful. And still he gave you again and again and again. You fell short in your duties and still he guided you. Still he forgave you. What will make you love Allah if it's not that? Every time you disobey him, he keeps on forgiving you. Every time you fall short, he keeps on guiding you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is his tarbiyah. This is how Allah nurtures your heart until by his permission, he causes it to die upon la ilaha illallah. And then he takes it and he brings it to Jannah. If that doesn't make you love Allah, then what will make you love Allah? So this ayah is all about loving Allah Jalla fi ula, and about feeling love for Allah and you love Allah because of who Allah is and what Allah does and what Allah is described with. You love Allah because He is Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Malik, Al-Quddus, As-Salam because of His attributes and His actions. That's why you love Allah Azza wa Jal. That's what makes you love Allah Azza wa Jal. And that's why this first part of Surah Al-Fatiha, we praise Allah because of his names, his attributes, and his actions. And we remember how Allah nurtures us and looks after us and takes care of us. And we therefore love or increase in our love of Allah for that. And when you love Allah, what happens? Allah loves you. Allah loves you. When you love Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah Azza wa Jal loves you. You get a reward which is the same type of thing as the action that you did. You love Allah and Allah will love you. And when Allah loves you, He calls to Jibreel and He says, I love so and so, so you should love him. And then Jibreel loves him. 
And then Jibreel calls out to the angels in the heavens that Allah loves this person, so you should love him too. So all the angels in the heavens love him. Then Allah puts for him al-qabul fil ard. Allah puts for him acceptance on the earth so the people accept and welcome and you know they, they're accepting of him and of what he has to say or of her and of what he, she has to say and so on. And Allah Azza wa Jal loves every Muslim but he doesn't love them the same. Allah loves every Muslim but he doesn't love them the same. So just as your iman differs from person to person, likewise, how much Allah Azza wa Jal loves you differs according to your righteousness and your sincerity and your following of the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. This is a continuation. The ayah is continuing. We know it's continuing because of the, the kasra, the, 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 the vowel marking, the it. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Because it started Alhamdu Lillahi Rabbi Al Alameen Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. So it's it's a continuation. It's like you could put bullet points. Alhamdu, all praise is for Allah, one bullet point. Lord of the worlds, next bullet point. Ar Rahman, next bullet point. Ar Rahim, next bullet point. Maliki Yomidin. The praise is for Allah, who is Rabbul Alameen, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. Maliki Yawmiddin. Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim both come from the word Rahmah. So both Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim indicate that Allah is the Rahmah. And we know this because Allah said it in the Quran, وَرَبُّكَ الْغَفُورُ ذُ الرَّحْمَةِ Allah is the possessor of mercy. But we know something and I'm going to teach you a little principle which I'm sure you knew anyway. Nothing in the Quran repeats itself for no reason. There is no, you know, part of eloquence is that you only say what needs to be said. You know, sometimes I waffle on in my, in my classes. I know, it's okay. I, you know, may Allah make it easy for you. But sometimes I waffle a bit. Waffling is a sign of a lack of eloquence, right? When you just say things in the fewest number of words possible, that's a sign of, of eloquence. So one of the features of the Quran is that everything is said in as few words as possible. With the biggest meanings and the most powerful meanings. So why did Allah say then, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim? If they both come from Ar-Rahman. Why not suffice with one of them? Why not say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman. Maliki Yawmiddin. Why Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim? There's a difference between the two. Both of them refer to Allah's Rahmah in different ways. So Ar-Rahman refers to Allah's Rahmah as an attribute of Him. In other words, let me give you an English translation, the most merciful. That Allah is the one that has unlimited mercy. That's the meaning of Ar-Rahman. So if that's the meaning of Ar-Rahman, you can't give that name to anyone, any human being, right? Even you can't even say Rahman like that, even without Al. Because Rahman is the owner of unlimited mercy, infinite mercy that covers everything. رَبَّنَا وَسِعْتَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ رَحْمَةً وَعِلْمًا Our Lord, you encompassed everything with your mercy and your knowledge. So here, the rahma that is mentioned in Ar-Rahman is the fact that Allah has unlimited, infinite mercy. The key bit is Allah has. It's the word has here that's the key in Ar-Rahman. That you're describing Allah as having that infinite mercy. As for Ar-Rahim, for those who know Arabic, it's ala wazni fa'il. It's on the pattern fa'il. Rahim. And so it means the action of doing. 
That's what fa'il generally in Arabic is, the action of doing. So here it's not about Allah having mercy. It's about Allah giving or bestowing mercy. And this is the correct or the stronger opinion with regard to Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Some of the scholars, among them, Sheikh bin Uthaymeen, Rahimullah Ta'ala, they took it a different way. They said Ar-Rahman is general mercy and Ar-Rahim is special mercy. But we think the first opinion is more correct because in some ayat, Allah mentions that He is Rahim to all of mankind. So it kind of takes away the special a little bit. But it makes more sense to say that Rahim on the pattern Fa'il is about Allah bestowing that mercy. It's not just His, that he just, it just, it's His, that's it. It's His and He bestows it to whoever He wants. Does He bestow it equally to everybody? All of us get exactly 100 billionth of a share of Allah's mercy. No. Allah gives it to whoever He wants in whatever quantity that He wants. And that is the meaning of Ar Rahim, the bestower of mercy, the one who gives out His mercy. And that is more correct than saying the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. Because there are some ayat in the Qur'an that don't match that. It doesn't match up with all the ayat in the Qur'an. What matches up with all the ayat in the Qur'an is to say that Ar-Rahman is the possessor of mercy and Ar-Rahim is the bestower, the one who gives it, the one who sends it out to whoever he wants. When you think about the Rahmah of Allah, What's the emotion there? What, how do you feel emotionally? You feel hope. You feel immensely hopeful that Allah is gonna have mercy on you. Allah is gonna forgive you. Allah is gonna give you Jannah. Allah is not gonna punish you. How can Allah Azza wa Jal punish when He is Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim? And that gives you hope. Too much hope can lead to laziness. And too much hope or having love and hope together without fear is exactly what the Christians fell into today. And that is why, have you noticed that the Christians basically don't have any deen left? There's no deen, there's no laws, there's no haram. When you ask them what's haram, they have to really think like, well... Murder. Okay, what else? Uh, I suppose theft, if it's really, if it's bad. Like they don't have anything left that's haram because they don't have any fear in their deen. Their deen is just love and hope. If you love God, God will save you. Doesn't matter what you did. Human beings don't work like that. And that is why as a Muslim, you have to be balanced between fear and hope. And that is where the third ayah comes in. Maliki yawmiddin. This, it brings you back down again. You are flying up in the sky in hope. Allah will never punish me. Nothing bad is going to happen to me. Maliki yawmiddin. And then you remember yawmiddin. The day of recompense. A deen, the day when everyone will get what they deserve. And that makes you scared of Allah. There are two ways of reading this ayah. There are two qira'at. You can read it, Maliki yawmiddin, and that's the reading that we read in Hafs, that Hafs and Asim, that's the one that we read most of us. In some of the other qira'at, you might have heard the imams reading, Maliki Yawmiddin. If I'm not mistaken, Maliki is the majority of the Qur'an. They read Maliki Yawmiddin. The difference is that Malik talks about ownership and Malik talks about sovereignty, being like a king. The two are very close together. This is a beautiful thing about the Qira'at. I'm not going to take too much longer. This is a beautiful thing, inshallah. This is a beautiful thing about the Qira'at. 
Look at how two words that are different, they're not the same word. Malik and Malik are not the same word. They're not exactly the same meaning, but they complement each other. And that's why if you never give any time to think about the qira'at, the different styles of reading, you're going to miss out on some of the meanings of the Qur'an. So Malik is all about possession. The owner, the possessor. They're all of the mulk on that day. لِمَنِ الْمُلْكُ الْيَوْمِ لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَهَارِ Who is the dominion? Who does everything belong to on that day? To Allah, the one that cannot be resisted, the one who is alone and cannot be resisted. That's fearful. There's no one else going to save you on that day. If Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't forgive you, there is nobody, there is no angel, there is no prophet, there is no one coming to save you. If Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't forgive you, because Allah is Maliki Yawmiddin. Nobody else owns the day of resurrection. Nobody has control of it. No one except Allah. Not an angel, not a prophet, not anyone else. That doesn't mean there isn't shafa'ah, intercession. But intercession will be given to those who Allah approves of. It will not be given to the people who the Prophet wasallam chose. It will be given to people that Allah chooses for him. He will ask and Allah will accept, but he will only ask on behalf of those that Allah approves of. So you don't have any, any sort of refuge or anywhere to run or anywhere to hide except to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لَا مَلْجَا مِنَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا إِلَيْهِ there is no way to escape Allah except by going to Allah. The only place you can escape Allah is by going to Allah. And that's why we say, Allahumma inna na'udhu bi ridaka min sakhatik wa bi afwika min ukubatik wa bika mink. O oh Allah, we seek refuge with your pleasure from your anger and your forgiveness from your punishment and with you from you there is no other one that can save me except Allah so the only one I can ask is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so when you think about Maliki Yawmiddin which is the other Qira'ah you think about ownership and you think about sovereignty that Allah is the king of kings there is no king coming on that day no one on that day is going to have lineage or gonna have power or gonna come and say I'm Fulan Ibn Fulan from Ali Fulan it doesn't mean anything on that day not even the people from the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the one whose lineage slows them down man bihi amalu, lam bihi nasabu. the one whose lineage slows the one whose actions slow him down his lineage will not speed him up no one's going to come and say, I'm a Sayyid, I'm from Ahl Bayt, I'm from Fulan, I'm this person, I'm a king, I'm an Amir, I'm Fulan. On that day, nothing matters. Allah is Maliki Yawmiddin, the king of that day. And every king in this world has his kingdom because Allah gave it to him. But some people don't recognize that. Alhamdulillah, the Muslims, they recognize, they say, my kingdom came to me from Allah. But some of the non-Muslims, they might say, إِنَّمَا أُوتِيتُهُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ عندي. I got this because I'm clever, like Qarun said. And it's only the Muslims who recognize that the kingdom on that day is only for Allah. And everything that came to you in this dunya, everything you own and everything you possess and everything you're in charge of is only because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave it to you as a test and a trial. And so we feel fear. We think about Allah's punishment. We think about Jahannam. We think about Yawm ad -Din and we start getting scared and we balance. What would happen if you had too much fear? You would start becoming despairing, losing hope. Allah will never forgive me. Allah will certainly punish me. I have no hope. 
When you combine Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawm din you have both. You have fear and you have hope. You hope in Allah's mercy and you fear Allah's punishment. We went on for a long time, but I want to get halfway through so that we can, inshaAllah ta'ala, next week we can finish Surah Al-Fatiha. The other surahs will not be long like this, but I feel like, wallah, we should give Surah Al-Fatiha a, a couple of weeks, even if we give it three weeks, because it's important every day in every raka'ah you're reading the same thing again and again. So it's really important we understand it, inshaAllah ta'ala, as best we can. And then we can move on and we can go through the other surahs. Again, maybe some of the small surahs might take a bit long on. And then as we get to the longer ones, we can just, you know, can try and, and get through the material. That's what Allah Azza wa Jal made easy for me to mention. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Wassalatu wassalam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Jazakumullah khairan for watching. Please subscribe, share, and you can visit muhammadtim.com.